Now, as well as local factors adversely affecting wound healing, there are many systemic factors that can adversely affect wound healing as well. Or to put it another way, there's lots of systemic things we can do to the overall condition of our patients to promote the wound healing process. And perhaps the most obvious one is nutrition. So for wounds to heal, you need carbohydrates in the diet because wound healing uses a lot of energy. It's a metabolically demanding process and we need plenty of carbohydrates to be oxidized by the oxygen to produce the energy to do the building work. So we need plenty of carbohydrates. And the amount of carbohydrates that someone needs after a significant wound actually goes up quite a lot. It's very often underestimated how much extra food people with significant injuries do need to recover, especially burn injuries where the daily calorific requirement can be quite high. And it's very important to give enough calories in the form of carbohydrate because if we don't, the body will start raiding its protein supply, break, breaking down its protein supply into amino acids to use those to produce energy giving molecules from proteins. So giving plenty of carbohydrates is important to prevent excessive muscle catabolism, muscle breakdown. And of course we need to give proteins as well. There's 20 amino acids and 10 of those are essential. So we have to make sure that the patient has all of the 10 essential amino acids and we need to make sure they have enough of it because again they need to build up the new tissues. And if there's any risk of infection, protein is particularly important because we need proteins to generate the antibodies, the immunoglobulin foot soldiers of the immune system that actually fight the potential antigenic infecting pathogenic microorganisms. So we need carbohydrate and protein, but we also need some fats as well. And there are some essential fatty acids. So we don't want to feed patients lots of um, animal fats, but you know, to make sure they've got nuts, for example, is good because they can contain essential fatty acids. And fish also contains essential fatty acids. So thinking about the fat in a patient's diet and the type of fat, making sure that you are feeding them the essential fatty acids, again, very important for wound healing. And then we've got the vitamins. The obvious one is vitamin C. Vitamin C is essential for collagen formation. So even if you've got all of the amino acids, you can build the collagen strands, but you need the vitamin C to link the collagen strands together. So vitamin C is essential for healthy collagen formation. Patients need to have enough vitamin C for wound healing. Minerals, one of the minerals that's talked about is zinc. Now zinc is actually a cofactor for many different uh, types of enzyme, probably two or 300 different types of enzymes use zinc as a cofactor. So it's very important for wound healing, for epithelialization, <clears throat> we need enough zinc. Now, if you give extra vitamin C and extra zinc, that doesn't make wound healing occur faster. So giving mega doses of vitamin C or mega doses of zinc is not going to help. So unfortunately, we can't give wound healing a boost by giving more, but if the patients haven't got enough, then wound healing can be adversely affected. So it's making sure patients have enough, but giving mega doses isn't going to be effective in promoting wound healing, but deficiency will certainly delay it. And another one that some research is start, starting to come out on now is, is flavonoids. Flavonoids are present in the colored parts of fruits and vegetables. And there is evidence that flavonoids can help with healing of chronic wounds, such as leg ulcers, leg ulcers for example. So make sure the patient's got a balanced diet and an adequate diet, and bear in mind they're probably going to need more than normal to facilitate the healing process if a lot of tissues have been damaged. Age is going to be a factor. <clears throat> Children do heal up quickly. Older people can often heal up more slowly. But as well as that, older people can have nutritional deficiencies. They can have comorbidities. 
So don't just think that someone's wound is healing more slowly because they're older. Think for specific factors that could be actually adversely affecting wound healing as well. Now another factor adversely affecting wound healing is delayed inflammatory response. We know that inflammation is the first and an essential phase of the healing process and if there's a delayed inflammatory response healing's not going to occur. And sometimes we can be the culprits here, this can be iatrogenic. Particularly if a patient is on steroidal drugs. These are massively anti-inflammatory and they will prevent normal wound healing. So if a surgical patient has been on steroids, the wound can simply fall apart. Or if you've got a patient who's got a leg ulcer, but they're on prednisolone for their asthma, then the leg ulcer is probably not going to heal effectively as long as the patient is on the prednisolone steroid type drugs. So we need a normal inflammatory response. Now, another possible problem is changes in body temperature. So patients that are febrile, hyperthermic patients, again, the enzymes might not work properly and that can adversely affect wound healing. Or if patients are hypothermic, then if someone's hypothermic, okay, that's going to mean the enzymes aren't going to work properly. But as well as that, if a wound is cold, there's going to be vasoconstriction of the blood vessels. And that's going to reduce the blood supply. And a good blood supply is absolutely essential for wound healing. So we don't want the wound to be cooled and we don't want the patient to be cold. Now, what about patient mobility? Well, very often we actually want the wound itself to be immobilized, but it's good for the patient to be mobile if they can, because that can improve the circulation, meaning that more blood will go to the wound. And as well as that, of course, we have to bear in mind the complications of immobility. We don't want our wounded patients to get a deep venous thrombosis and a pulmonary embolism and die. We don't want them to get hypostatic pneumonia because we've kept them in bed for too long. We don't want them to get pressure sore formation. We don't want them to get bone mineral loss and urinary calculi. We don't want them to get psychological depression because they're immobile. So normal mobility usually is good. It prevents the complications of immobility. Now, psychological stress. If someone's under stress, if they're anxious and they're worried, then they're going to produce a lot of adrenal hormones. They're going to produce adrenal cortical hormones, such as hydrocortisone, which of course is a steroid, which is going to inhibit the inflammatory response. So in theory, that's going to be bad, isn't it? So if we reduce the patient's psychological stress, we reduce their anxiety levels, we reduce the amount of hydrocortisone and other cortical steroid hormones their adrenal cortexes are secreting, and then presumably that's going to improve wound healing by lowering their stress levels. And adrenal medullary hormones, the catecholamines, the adrenaline, the norepinephrine, the adrenaline and Adrenaline is epinephrine and noradrenaline is norepinephrine, it's the same thing. But we don't want a lot of these hormones circulating around because again they're going to do things like increase blood sugar levels and adrenaline is going to be vasoconstricting to superficial wounds as well. And again it would be reasonable to assume that that can reduce the blood supply and inhibit the process of wound healing. So lowering the patient's stress can actually promote wound healing. Now having said that, there's not good trial data on it, but it does actually make sense. And as well as that, if the patient believes in you and they believe in what, they're, in, in what you're doing, they believe that you're trying to help them and they believe that you have the ability to help them, then what does the patient enjoy as a consequence of those beliefs? It's called the placebo effect, isn't it? The patient enjoys the placebo effect. Now, there's no trial data on how important the placebo effect is in wound healing, but I think it may well be significant. So we want to reduce the patient's stress, make them feel well looked after, make them feel that they're in very competent hands, give them a positive placebo effect, and it's reasonable to assume that that will enhance the healing process. 
Now anything that causes ischemia or low blood pressure is going to adversely affect the blood flow to the wound. So if there's an ischemia for local reasons, less blood supply to the wound, lower healing rates. That's fairly obvious. So if there's any ischemia, relieve it, work out what's causing the ischemia and restore the blood supply back to normal levels. And hypotension can also cause ischemia as well because when someone's hypotensive you're going to get a reflex peripheral vasoconstriction. That's going to lower the blood supply to some of the superficial tissues especially and that can reduce healing rates. So think about what's causing the hypotension and treat it. So for example, is the patient dehydrated? Well fine, we'll treat the dehydration. We don't want ischemia, we don't want hypotension. Now as well as wounds getting a good blood supply, they need a good oxygen supply. So if the patient is systemically hypoxic, if the blood has not got enough oxygen in it, if they've got a uh, hypoxemia, low partial pressure low partial pressures of oxygen or low saturations of oxygen in the blood, not enough oxygen is getting to the wound. And the oxygen is vital to provide the energy for wound healing to carry on. So if someone's got respiratory disease or other complications causing hypoxia, again, correct that underlying pathology and improve the patient's oxygenation. Now I'm just wondering, you think it's a good idea for patients with wounds to smoke? Smoking going to be helpful? Well, obviously not. Smoking is very counterproductive. Nicotine is a vasoconstrictor. It's going to narrow blood vessels. It's going to reduce the blood supply. The carbon monoxide in cigarette smoke is going to combine with the haemoglobin in the patient's red blood cells. That's going to form carboxyhemoglobin. Carboxyhemoglobin is a stable compound and when the carbon monoxide is occupying the haemoglobin sites and we have the carboxyhemoglobin, then we can't have the oxyhemoglobin. The oxygen cannot be carried in the same cell or on the same oxygen binding site of the haemoglobin molecule if there's carbon monoxide there. So carbon monoxide is going to acutely reduce the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. That means any blood that is getting to the wound is going to be carrying less oxygen and we know that oxygenation is vital for the anabolic healing processes. And if a patient does smoke, they can get rid of the carboxyhemoglobin in just a few days. So if a patient's smoking, there's an immediate benefit if they stop smoking because it will increase the oxygenation of the wound if they stop smoking. And the other thing that smoking does is smoking interferes with vitamin C metabolism and increases the excretion of vitamin C. So patients that smoke are going to have less vitamin C in their blood, less vitamin C activity, and we've already seen that vitamin C is essential for collagen formation and for protein synthesis. So if a patient does insist on carry on smoking, then it's probably best to give them some extra vitamin C, but it's not going to undo the extra other harmful effects of smoking we've already discussed. So smoking, let's say it should be uh, discouraged. Now, a poor immune system is another factor. If there's reduced immunity, there's increased possibilities of wound infection. So think about things that can be adversely affecting your patient's immune system. Have they got HIV, for example? Well, we could give them antiretroviral drugs. Are they malnourished? Well, we could give them good nutrition. Whatever's causing the patient's compromised immunity, think about that, improve their immune function, reduce the possibility of wound infection and hopefully wound healing will progress on nicely. And poor patient hygiene can be another factor. Now chronic wounds are going to be colonized with bacteria. So if you swab a chronic wound, you're going to grow something from it. That doesn't mean the wound's infected. 
Chronic wounds like healing leg ulcers can be infected with a different organism. Sorry, I used the wrong word. Not infected with a di different organism, colonized by a different organism every week if you culture it every week. So wound colonization per se is not going to adversely affect wound healing. Wound infection will, and wound infection is when the presence of the bacteria generates an immunological response. And poor hygiene can do this because there can be transfer of infection from one part of the patient's body, for example from the anus, to the wound. That's possible if there's poor hygiene. Or if there's poor hygiene between individuals, then there can be cross-infection. And again, we don't want cross-infection, especially as there might be cross-infection with resistant organisms such as methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Now I think the last adverse factor I'll mention in wound healing is poorly managed diabetes mellitus. If diabetes mellitus is poorly managed, there's going to be a hyperglycemia. The bacteria like to eat glucose, so there's a good supply of glucose ready for the bacteria to eat, making wound infection more likely. And also if there's hyperglycemia, in the blood there's going to be more glucose in the tissue fluids and that's going to adversely affect cellular migration particularly it's going to affect the cellular migration of neutrophils and macrophages they're not going to be able to move to the bacteria and it's going to reduce the efficiency with which they can phagocytose bacteria again reducing the vital function of these cells reducing the amount of cytokines they're going to produce, reducing the amount of bacteria they can phagocytose, making infection more likely, and making wound healing a much less efficient process. So hyperglycemia should be managed with good diabetic control. So quite a few systemic factors there. So it's not just thinking about how we're going to treat the wound, it's about how, how we're going to treat the whole person the body and the mind of the whole person to optimise wound healing. Let's get this wound healed up. Let's get the patient back to normal activity. Let's get them back to work. That's the aim of the game.